Every year on April the 22nd, the world commemorates Earth Day. The goal is to create awareness about our environment and the threats of climate change and biodiversity loss. This year's theme is invest in our planet. But the world has been marking Earth Day for more than 50 years and not much seems to have changed despite countless warnings, scientific studies and various agreements. From Earth Day to Earth Hour to environmental summits like last year's COP26 in Glasgow, are all efforts failing? And what else can be done to achieve a significant investment in our planet and limit future global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius? The United Nations Environment Programme Executive Director, Inga Anderson, talks to Al Jazeera. Inga Anderson, Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Well, thank you for having me. Before we get into this, I, I was curious about your uh, personal connection with environmental matters. In my experience, many who are passionate about the health of our planet have this kind of deep resonance with the world we live in. Is that something that applies to you and does it go back to childhood? Oh, absolutely it does. You know, um, my grandmother was from the high, high north in Norway, uh, north of the polar circle. And then she married my grandfather, who was from Denmark. And I guess when you live under these, it's a little bit like people who live in, in very arid and very hot areas, like uh, the Arab world in, in parts of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. When you live under these extreme conditions, you learn to appreciate nature. And so from my grandmother, she taught me everything about plants and how we should appreciate it and how special and unique it was from right from I was a little baby. And so that kind of came with the territory whenever we were in uh, in her house, or indeed uh, my mother, of course, right. passed it on to us. And, and so do you, that's, do, you that's now, very do you now still manage to make that connection? And if so, how do you do it? I do. You know, I live in Kenya, and Kenya is one of the most stunningly beautiful, amazing countries you could choose to live in. And that's where United Nations Environment Programme is based. And, you know, it's very easy to get to nature when you live in Kenya and nature in Kenya, uh, you can you can actually I mean, I have monkeys that come into my garden, uh, mm. you know, amazing bird life and so on. And I go for walks uh, as well as taking trips out of Nairobi. So, yes, I absolutely get anchored when I am in nature. It's very healthy for us, I think, for our Indeed. inner Indeed it is. Well, you know where this is heading, because given your connection with nature and the natural world, and given the responsibility that you have at the UN Environment Programme, the environmental degradation that we're all seeing all around us all the time must weigh very heavily on you. It does, because, um, well, we, at UNEP, we speak about this sort of triple planetary crisis, a climate crisis, and most people have understood now that we are living it, but also the nature and biodiversity loss crisis. We are losing about, we're set to use, lose about a million of those 7.8 million species that we have and the pollution and waste crisis, that toxic trail that follows development. In all of these crises by which we are all impacted, it's the poorest who are impacted the most. And it simply is something that is not sustainable. So taking nature action, climate action and pollution avoidance action is critical and that's what we are trying to make the world do and this uh, earth day obviously is critical for raising further the awareness and the activism and government and business uh, determination to drive to where we need to get to we just can't uh, kick that can down the road anymore right we must be optimistic because there's no other way of dealing with this but it, it must be hard sometimes it is because the numbers speak for themselves and, and we at UNEP, we issue immediately prior to every uh, COP, climate COP, we issue an emissions gap report that tells the world where it should be going and where it is. You know, uh, we've shaved, we, we emit about 55 gigatons of CO2 per year. And, to, and we have about 500 gigatons left to sort of put into the atmosphere. 
and we should really have be reducing um, significantly. Um, we should be reducing 55. At Glasgow, we reduce by four. So uh, we're not where we need to be, which is why we say that uh, right now we are heading to an above three degree world if we continue as we are. So getting greater ambition, getting greater speed with which the promises we make are implemented uh, on the climate track is absolutely necessary. But here's the thing, if you do those things, if you invest in nature, if you invest in cleaner and greener, you know, our lives will be better and nature will be better and uh, overall, the future will be better. Remember during the lockdowns, how clean the air was, how all of a sudden in dirty cities, people could see uh, how many kids will not get, get asthma, how many cancer cases will we avoid? These are the kind of issues that we need to have a conversation about as well. We talk about optimism. Perhaps there was a little bit coming out of the last climate conference, which was in Glasgow, as you know. Uh, and there we all were perhaps thinking we might just be on the cusp of the kind of change that we need. And then Russia invaded Ukraine and the question of energy supply just permeates around the world and the difficulties that that presents. And we're beginning to go backwards, aren't we? Well, certainly, I mean, we are we have to. Well, in Glasgow, we did get a mention of coal, which is really, really good. We did get a clarity around carbon markets, which is very good. We did get great ambitions on methane, which is really good, uh, plus all the other stuff that I'm not going to go into right now. So yes, some progress was made. But, but of course, as countries are looking at from where they wish to purchase their hydrocarbons, that has become an issue all the more uh, with, with the Ukraine situation and the war. Now here, I think it's fair to say that uh, gas uh, is uh, a, a relatively clean burning fossil fuel, but nevertheless one from which we have to exit. So um, whilst countries are rushing to find alternative supplies in view of, uh, of, of, of the war, um, I think it's fair to say that this is also a moment at which countries can actually make significant investment in green and clean. And so they taking can, that opportunity... They can. It's true. Forgive me for jumping in. But, but as we speak, old coal, coal fields are being reopened. Uh, the oil majors are rubbing their hands in glee at, at the prospect of you know, further exploration. The, the prices are, are sky high. So they can afford to get stuck back into this. And, and that just means more and more emissions, as I say, going in the wrong direction. You know, our our economy is based on on hydrocarbon, on fossil fuels right now. So building that other network will take some time. But I am pushing as hard as I can, and I hope that everyone else will do that, that yes, there is that move now towards some hydrocarbon, which is not the way to go. But I understand that from one day to the next, you, you can't just build a renewable uh, production. But uh, that nevertheless, using this opportunity as an opportunity to move towards renewable is the thing to do. We missed that train during COVID. We could have used the subsidies for this. Uh, we could have made them sort of carbon conditional. We didn't to the extent that we should have. Now is the time to make this happen. And certainly for me, I'm going to try to hold everyone's feet to the fire on this dimension. You mentioned the biodiversity crisis in deep trouble. We're set to lose one million species, as you mentioned, if we don't reverse it. And yet those critical talks to try and reverse this situation, how the world will, will face up to these biodiversity challenges, have made glacial progress. We're moving, I think, in August, there will be more finalised talks at the Biodiversity Conference then. But, but this, this slow progress, not only in the biodiversity talks, but in climate talks, it must just drive you mad, given what's at stake and how the, the can is continually kicked down the road, to use your phrase. You know, um, it, it, there are days of despair and then there are days of great joy, right? Um, the truth is that uh, nature is what feeds us, sustains us, gives us the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the houses we live in. It's not like it's an immaterial thing. And we're making this assumption that nature will just be there, that harvest will follow harvest, that rains will come when they're supposed to, that there will be frost or winds when we're used to, that the fish will arrive when they're supposed to, and we can fish them, etc. Well, when we're messing with the earth system, all of this 
gets out of whack, which is why that uh, agreement that you referred to on biodiversity, on nature, is so critical. They made some progress in recent preparatory meetings in Geneva. Now we'll have an extra meeting that will be held at our headquarters in Nairobi. And we like to think that there is something called the Nairobi spirit, which is a time when we sort of, there is that goodness in Kenya that can usually bring about some breakthrough. So we are gonna to try to make that happen before the biodiversity COP, which will happen this August, um, because you're right, we need to stretch and we need to understand that um, the kind of forces that are undermining nature, overfishing, overexploitation, as well as agriculture, uh, are, uh, 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 unsustainable agriculture are areas that we can flip. We can make agriculture nature positive. We can protect our oceans and still fish. We can do all of this in a smart way. Right now, one fifth of all the food that we produce go right into the garbage can. That's waste of nature, waste of soils, waste of pesticides and chemicals that we may or may not have used and waste of water. So how do we make a healthy a nutritious diet for everyone and uh, the kind of exploitation of nature that we need to have to live as humanity without sending nature over the cliff. That's what we need to do. And I'm absolutely convinced that we can do it, but it will take business. It will take leadership. It will take courage and it will take activists to keep pushing and holding to account. And of course, the media too. I wonder what role you think human nature has to play in all of this, because it is only human nature, isn't it, to, to think about the clear and present dangers, like Russia in Ukraine, for example, and not the, I don't know, more hazy and seemingly distant uh, things like climate change. We know they're not distant, but that might be the perception. And, you know, and the threat to biodiversity as well. It's just, it is human nature just to consider that as far away and, and not of the moment. No, and uh, you, you, it's a bullseye question because we, we are so selfish, this species called human, humans. We, 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 we think only about ourselves and not about the next and the next generation, which is amazing because we love our children and our grandchildren, isn't it? And yet we are not willing to make the kind of steps that we know, we do know, because science tells us so, have to be made. That is why it is the courageous leaders, it is the brave politicians who dare to say and tell it as it is, but also offer up the solutions because it is in that sounder uh, economy um, that is cleaner and greener, that you will have more decent jobs, you will have less poverty, but, but yes, it is a shift, but just like we don't have the steam engines anymore or whatever, you know, we make these shifts. Um, and yes, some jobs are lost in the process because the steam engine engineers may not be around and those jobs are gone, but other jobs and more decent and cleaner jobs are created. So it does take leadership from all sides, CEOs, investors, bankers, as well as politicians and activists to make that shift. But yes, we are a selfish species. It's a, it's a fact. Reaching beyond that, that's where we need to get to. And you see leaders doing that sometimes at their peril, which is, of course, why sometimes uh, politicians just look at the four-year electoral cycle. Um, that's not good enough anymore. We need to have that deeper insight and that deeper horizon. This is exactly what I was going to say, because ultimately politicians and world leaders are concerned with the now, the right now and, and the next four-year term. Yes, and, the, and yet you can say that there have been these politicians who were larger than life, um, who looked at, you know, systemic shifts that needed to happen, rolling out the welfare state, rolling out the transport network in whatever country you might think, taking that understanding that that bridge that we construct today with 16 lanes will not be used today, but will you be used 100 years from now? Understanding that taking that subway underground rather than having it rumbling and dirty overground may be immaterial because today it's agriculture, but tomorrow it will be city. Those people who made those changes, and each one of us in our countries have examples like that of leaders who looked beyond and created a better world for that generation unborn. That's the kind of situation, that's the kind of leadership we need today. 
and thankfully there are examples of it in the past and uh, I, I remain convinced that there are uh, leaders today that have that longer, deeper horizon and looking uh, looking onto the oceans and the wave that is yet to hit our shores and therefore making the right choices. You talk of seismic shifts and another area where a seismic shift is required is in the realm of plastic pollution. Uh, it's a major problem. And in March, you presided over the uh, UN Environment Assembly focusing on the epidemic of single use plastics. Tell me what was achieved there and what you're hoping to achieve from it over the coming years. It was really a, a massive seismic shift, <laughs> as a matter of fact. And we were very, very proud of what the world decided. The world unanimously, 100, 193 member states of the United Nations, decided that they will embark on developing a treaty framework agreement, whatever it will be called, that will be legally binding and that will end plastic pollution. It will go from source to sea, the entire production chain, to reduce and, and obviously therefore um, reuse and, and, and recycle, but overall reduction so that we can land with a no plastic pollution world. This does not mean that we are anti-plastic. This just means that once we have taken it out of the Earth's belly in the form of fossil fuels and converted it into plastic, into the economy, we want it to stay circular in the economy. We do not want it to go back into the environment. We want to reduce the amount and we want to ensure that it stays circular. That can only happen if 193 countries work together. So now we have three years to negotiate the nitty gritty of the text, to fill out the colors of the color chart, so to speak, of the broad contours that were agreed in Nairobi in March. That's what will happen. We will begin with a meeting uh, later in May, and then it, we're gonna have a number of meetings over the coming three years to nail this thing down once and for all so that we can deal with an end and beat, as we like to say, plastic pollution. Right, it's a long old road though, isn't it? Because in many countries, for example, the plastic bag is still ubiquitous. Here in the Middle East, you know, you buy an apple and you get a plastic bag. It's, it's changing a mindset, isn't it? It is, but you know, again, I go back to my country, uh, Kenya, where I, mean, where I live right now, where UNIV is based, you know, they banned plastic bags seven years ago, Rwanda 15 years ago. Uh, you get a sizable fine. I think it's $1,000 if you're caught with a single-use plastic bags. And you know what? Life works just as fine. <laughs> I mean, it's a question of just sending the economic and the regulatory signals. Um, so, so Africa, I think it's something like out of 50-odd countries, 37 have instituted a degree of bans on single-use. So that is one, one part. We need to deal with packaging and all kinds of containers, which we need to move things from point A to point B. We're not gonna move it in glass, it's much heavier and it has much more fossil fuel uh, impact, obviously. But then once we have contained stuff, we need to keep, keep that in circulation. That's a story. So it can be done. It's a convenience, but think of it like this. You take your three tomatoes in the supermarket, you put them in a the plastic bag, you carry them for 10 minutes home or whatever you do, a thousand years in the landfill. Is that really worth it? And then, or you just incinerate, it becomes CO2. And think about it like this, that plastic bag doesn't go away. It just breaks down into ever smaller pieces, goes into the soil, into the wastewater, and finally into the ocean, where of course it stays forever as forever chemical. So it is not the way we want to live on this uh, world. And 193 countries agreed. Now the nitty gritty will have to come, but we can get there. All right. Now, UNEP turned 50 this year. I imagine nobody 50 years ago thought that the state of the world would be as it is today and the impacts, the environmental impacts felt by the most vulnerable. I think we hadn't quite appreciated the sort of footprint that our wealth generation would would leave behind we because as we've become wealthier as 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 a species humanity we have we have not quite understood that footprint now it is a very good thing we've become wealthier because we've lifted a lot of people out of poverty and there are still people that have to have that same journey out of poverty so don't get me wrong but now we have technology and understanding that we can actually make that shift 
um, to both have people not living in poverty and not doing so while destroying our planet. But it's worthwhile to, you know, we, we've we spent a lot of time talking about all the challenges we still have, but let's talk about some of the successes that we at UNEP are very proud about. You know, um, in the early 70s, there was a realization, oh gosh, there is an actual hole in the ozone layer at the polar ends of our, our world that the, the, the chemicals that we use for hairsprays and aerosols and foams and fire retardants are actually causing the breakdown of that layer that protects us from cancer and from heating. And what did we do? We instituted a treaty called the Montreal Protocol. We phased out 99.9% .9 of these chemicals. And today that ozone layer is healing itself. Now, um, that's a massive, so your refrigerator and your air conditioner or whatever else you have today has does not contain those chemicals. And just, was it August um, last year, the last gas pump or petrol pump in the last country pumped the last gallon of gas that had lead in it. So we've phased out lead. I could go on with other sort of mercury, you know, today your light bulbs, your batteries, uh, and even your dental amalgam does not contain uh, does not contain mercury. Again, a UNEP treaty that has delivered these results. So there are any number of successes, um, and also species that have been protected and are turning around and and coming back. So we can make these things happen. We just need to make it happen with a greater speed. Sure, and I imagine when you look back at your career one day. Uh, the realm of climate justice and environmental justice for the, the vulnerable will be something that you would look back with satisfaction if you've managed to achieve that. If we've managed, and it will be a collective we, because mm -hmm. it can only be done by the collective we. You know, um, just uh, a few weeks out, we will have the Desertification Convention COP, uh, a convention that deals with those who are at the living at the most marginal lands in the most marginal and fragile setting really, really exposed to the climate and, and nature extremes. And so understanding that justice, you know, it's fine to, to, to take the action, but how does that impact on the very poorest? Because we know that climate and other forms of injustice, um, uh, environmental injustice are leading to refugee crisis. You know, we already know that, you know, we are seeing people that cannot be sustained on the land that they have lived on for generations because of climate change. We're already seeing that uh, people being pushed into poverty because of nature collapse. So yes, that, that justice dimension is critical. And then one that we cannot ignore, look, we did not have vaccine justice, something as simple as ensuring that the poorest have access to vaccines. We can't do that with the planet. <laughs> and if people think that they can be sitting happily insulated in a wealthy pocket and not be impacted by poor, hungry, and, 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 and climate impacts in other areas, they're mistaken. We live one people on this one planet, and we got to work the solutions together with a sense of justice in our hearts and in our planning. Finally, uh, Executive Director, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, I wonder when you wake up in the morning, perhaps turn on the radio and you hear of, I don't know, yet another landslide, another flood, another drought, um, affecting hundreds, affecting thousands, perhaps. What goes through your mind? Is it sometimes, is it sometimes overwhelming? There are times when, yeah, you feel like, oh, you know, this could, this was so avoidable. Um, if only they had protected and reforested the, the mountain slopes. But you know, why did the mountain slopes get deforested? Because people were poor, maybe. So dealing with poverty and landing the sustainable development goals on the one hand, and yes, restoring nature on the other. So kind of on the one hand, yes, you get that, that sort of desperate feeling of despair at times. And then you say, okay, so what is it that needs to happen? How can we support that this does not happen again? How can we reach the very poorest and ensure? So I guess, yes, there are times when you get a little desperate, but then you see the successes that we have had 
as a global community managing environment and that gives you energy and you see the young people really stepping up and calling for that change that is part of giving i won't say hope but giving impetus to the action uh, which is where we need to go Inga Anderson, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.